welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, my name is Cindy Stover and I serve as a justice mobilizer uh, here in Canada um, for the CRCNA and for World Renew. Um, I will put our next slide up for that. And Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep, sure. Hi, I'm Chris Beningen and I do the justice mobilizing with World Renew in the US. Yeah, so um, Chris and I are here to host uh, Cindy, you might want to jump to no video, you're breaking up, which I think is fine because um, we're looking at the slides on the screen anyway. I'm seeing there may be some problems with the Perfect. Great. Okay. I'm going to put the chat box where I can see it so people can let me know if it gets any worse. So yeah, the 16 Days of Activism. This is a campaign run by the United Nations. Um, has been run for many years now, but this is the first year that World Renew is partnering on this to specifically raise awareness around the issue of gender-based violence and how uh, women and girls and families in North America and globally are affected by this issue. So we're just going to go through a couple quick stats at the beginning um, from the World Renew campaign. So um, if for the um, screen you're looking at right now, this does talk about the specific reality of COVID-19 and how that has actually heightened uh, some of the issues around gender-based violence. And um, World Renew has specifically uncovered that 80% of countries since the COVID-19 pandemic has begun has seen an increase um, in gender-based violence reports. And this is due to a number of reasons, due to isolation, due to lack of access to resources, due to physical limitations. And so this is one of the really big reasons why um, we thought it was so important to talk about this issue and to bring it into a North American context. So without further ado, I'll stop talking <laughs> and hand it over to our panelists. I'm gonna introduce Janice. Janice, do you want to just introduce yourself and really like quickly in a minute or two who you are and what Restorations does? Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for the privilege of being here. I'm the interim executive director at Restoration Second Stage Homes. We're based out of Halton and Hamilton regions in Canada. Our home, which we're just about to open, is a safe home. It will house three women for up to two years and provide wraparound supports uh, so the women can move to stability. These are women fleeing sex trafficking, and the support program would include things like legal, education, employment, medical, dental, and of course, spiritual supports. And um, I am just thrilled to be here. Our existing executive director, Jennifer Lucking, who many of you might know, had just gave birth to her second child, a beautiful baby boy. So I'm just filling in with the leadership uh, while the organization is going through this big transition of opening our first home. Thank you, Janice. And Michelle, go ahead. Atanse Michelle Nevadomi Nitsi Gasan Neki Awasquayo Amiskwichi Waskaigan Oche. So my name is Michelle. I am a Cree woman. I am coming at you from Edmonton, uh, Treaty 6 territory. I'm really honored to be here. I've been part of Edmonton Native Healing Center for almost 17, I think 17 years now. Um, we're really about working with the urban indigenous community. And I also um, run a little program called Esquayo Health. So Esquayo in uh, Cree means woman. So really focusing on women's health and wellness and really um, bringing in community. Um, so Edmonton Native Healing Center, we're a nonprofit organization. We are a community organization and um, we're all about just being there supporting the com community in whatever capacity that is needed. And the needs are pretty big. So we're really honored to be able to um, be there. So we've been around for, we're celebrating 30 years. So we've been around the hood for a while now. So I'm really honored to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. 
Um, I'm just quickly going to get switch off who's doing the screen sharing because it looks like my internet is not going to cooperate tonight. Um, so Chris, if you want to go ahead and do that, if that's possible, and then we'll invite Sarah to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Sarah Yor Van Osterhout. I am the founder and managing attorney at Lighthouse Immigrant Advocates, located in Holland, Michigan. Um, we are a nonprofit immigration law office and advocacy center serving actually all of Michigan right now. We were originally just serving West Michigan, but due to COVID, um, a lot of area nonprofits haven't been able to meet the immigration legal services needs of the Michigan population. And so we have um, we've actually very successfully moved to a remote services model. And for that reason, we've kind of take over, taken over some of um, the legal services needs of the, the entire state of Michigan. So we have a lot of folks referring to us from uh, east and west side of the state. Um, and we actually have a huge victim advocacy program. Um, and so uh, I, I do a lot of work with um, mostly mostly female victims. Um, I don't have too many uh, male victims. Um, and so as a result, I, I am really familiar with the subject matter and um, up close and personal. And I have lots of stories that I could share and I could probably talk all night about this particular issue. Um, so I will try to keep my part brief, but thanks for having me tonight. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. And Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Koss. I am a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church. I uh, started out in ministry doing a community development church plant and uh, doing that bivocationally. And then uh, shortly after that, um, this was my other bivocation, working with Safe Church Ministry. And so Safe Church is an agency of the Christian Reformed Church. And we exist in order to equip congregations in abuse awareness, prevention, and response. And a major part of why Safe Church exists is back in 1989, there was a study of how much abuse happens within the church and how much it happens in the world. And it was very clear that abuse happens just as much in the church. And we, uh, and for many people, it was a big eye opening because many in the church believe that we are different and uh, in reality we struggle and so we are here to heighten the awareness of the, the major impacts of abuse and that it impacts all of us in the church and so we hope that we can um, continue to to do our work in partnership with so many other people in churches and along with agencies like uh, many of you who are here today and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Eric. Um, so we're gonna start off with a specific question to each of our panelists about the agencies they work for, or I guess more so the communities they support. And um, I'll, just, I'll just say a quick reminder here too, if any of you who are participating in this webinar, uh, if you have questions along the way, please post them in the chat box. Um, we're gonna be monitoring that throughout the session. And there's gonna be time at the end to have your questions answered. So don't feel like you have to save them up. Please um, put them in the chat box as we go and then we'll come back to them at the end. So the first question we're going to ask our panelists is how does gender-based violence affect the community you support? How, how are those individuals um, impacted by gender-based violence? And I guess also, of course, what does your agency do to support them? So we'll start with Janice. Thank you so much. So um, our agency supports victims of human trafficking and uh, the World Health Organization has gathered statistics and 94% of sex trafficking is women and girls. So it's a significant issue. And um, as I said briefly, we provide safe housing 
But what I'm going to do today to talk about the significant issue of gender-based violence around human trafficking and sexual exploitation is to look at seven myths and misconceptions that exist very commonly across Canada and the United States about the issue of sex trafficking. And um, we'll just, I, I'm sure my slides are gonna be coming up in a second, uh, talking about seven really critical myths that exist that we need to debunk because we're missing what's happening to girls and women who are on, being faced with what is being considered and called the worst gender-based violence in the planet. So the very first myth is the myth that women and girls are being brought from foreign locations and sex trafficked in Canada and the United States. This is actually not true at all. In Canada alone, the statistics are that 93% of sex trafficking is happening to domestic girls and women. These are girls and women born in Canada, or if they've immigrated to Canada, they're Canadian citizens. And that's happening in the United States also. So as horrible as it is to bring foreign individuals into a nation like Canada or the United States to be sex trafficked, this is a local issue. It's happening to local girls and women. The second myth that I'm gonna talk about right now, and it's very much misunderstood, is that sex trafficking is only happening in big cities. So in Canada and the United States, wherever there is a highway, there is sex trafficking. So wherever there's a situation where there's short-term rental type of accommodation, sex trafficking is happening. So think about your own communities, even if you're living in a rural place, Every pretty much every place in Canada in the United States is touched by a highway and we're talking even just a secondary highway. So a motel, a hotel or even some sort of rental accommodation, like a, you know, an apartment, if there's some sort of temporary accommodation, sex trafficking is happening. Sex trafficking is happening to our girls and women right here on Canadian and American highways. The next myth is um, um, is the fact uh, is that we, persons are coerced and is this the third slide? Okay, is that um, persons are coerced into sex trafficking by someone they do not know or trust. So this is very significant because we have many of us have visions of the movie that Liam Neeson was in um called taken a few years ago and this is where his daughter was went over to paris she was in a very beautiful paris apartment and sex traffickers came and broke in and kidnapped her by violent force now it is possible that sex trafficking can happen by kidnapping but that's absolutely the exception what ends up happening is sex traffickers are engaging in very sophisticated behavior to lure and groom girls over a period of time so what happens is that, I'm still on this myth, the issue is, is that uh, they will identify girls that show a few traits. One is that they are vulnerable because they're socially isolated. And the second is that they're vulnerable because they have low self-esteem. So it's really tragic because we know in our society right now, girls are showing some of the lowest levels of self-esteem in history. And what's happening is the sex traffickers are using social media and the internet predominantly to reach into those girls' lives. They have ways of identifying by the social media postings of our girls and daughters to show that these girls are socially isolated or they have low self-esteem. And so the reality, though, is these could be very bright girls. We've got girls who are straight A students, but they might be like the nerd girl. They could be attractive, but nerdy, and maybe they're getting bullied at school, but they're somehow isolated. And these Romeo pimps, they're called a Romeo pimp because they literally take on the role of a boyfriend. They are spending significant time to build the trust of the girl over time, and really, the girl believes he's her boyfriend. So we can take weeks or months for a pimp to groom a girl he takes her out on dates he treats her like a princess he, she's probably this is often the first man that she's fallen in love with and often the first person she's had sexual activity with so you can imagine a teenager or a young adult woman 
is kind of the first man in her life that she's completely adores. She literally has fallen in love with him because he's lured her into this emotional relationship. She trusts him implicitly and he is the foundation of her world. She's socially isolated. She puts everything into this relationship. So then when he's got her complete emotional trust, she will do whatever he asks her to do. She will have sex with another man or do some other sex act that she wants nothing to do with, but she'll do it because she so trusts and believes that this man deeply loves her. It's complete and utter emotional manipulation that causes the end result of terrible gender-based violence. The next myth. So we think, okay, so these girls are in this business and there's a lot of money trading hands. You know, maybe the girls are making some money. And so, you know, that might, you know, the fact that they might, if they're from an isolated situation, be earning something. No, this isn't what happens at all. These girls are so traumatized and psychologically manipulated that they can literally be kept collecting hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars in a day or a night session, and they will hand everything over their pimp. This pimp will control everything in her life because she trusts him utterly. He has taken a long time to gain her trust. And the issue is too, is that sex trafficking is highly lucrative to her pimps. They, uh, on average, one pimp will earn $250,000 annually on just one girl. So you've got men going into this because they are earning a lot of money. And a lot of these men are not necessarily connected to organized crime. Men are figuring out that through gender-based violence, they can earn a lot of money. The next myth. So you might think, okay, so it's a really difficult situation, um, but you know, the girl's been locked up in chains and she's you know, been put in this situation. So of course she can't escape in that situation, but if she were released from chains, she'd be able to run away. Well, first of all, it's a very, very damaging misconception and sensationalized situation that all of the girls in sex trafficking are tied up in chains. That is actually the exception. What I have to underscore is the gender-based violence is so damaging in sex trafficking that girls feel a psychological prison. They are so traumatized, they can have post-traumatic stress disorder for their entire life. The trauma is incredible. Think about what we might know about one rape. Have one woman um, violated by rape is horrific and the trauma is intense. These girls are involved in acts that are non-consensual. They do not want to be there. They've been manipulated and now are emotionally pulled into this. They do not want to be there. And every single act of violence against them is non-consensual. And it's like consistent rape constantly. The trauma is so immense that they literally do not feel that they can leave. So the door could be technically open to them to cross the threshold and get out. They cannot. They are psychologically paralyzed uh, by the inability to be able to leave. And that's why girls can be caught in this for years and years and years. And the last myth. So you think, okay, well, my daughter, like she would always talk to me, you know, if she ended up getting involved in something, you know, where she was being treated badly, I'm sure she would reach out. Well, unfortunately, this is a really troubling myth because it doesn't happen all the time. The girls are, you know, again, they're groomed into this rela love relationship with their Romeo pimp. This is the tendency. This is the way it tends to happen. And what happens is shame. The shame is so immense. These are acts of sex they did not want to consent to. They didn't want to be involved. But think again what we might know about an act of rape. The shame is so overwhelming. These girls are essentially being raped repetitively. The shame is so immense. They're so mired in shame. They don't feel like they can reach out and reach up for help. And so they don't ask. I'm going to leave it there. I know that was very heavy content, but this is a reality that's happening right now in your community. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share and to help you understand what's going on with sex trafficking. Thank you, Janice. Thank you for sharing and for um, giving us a, a bit of a picture of what is happening in the with the lives of these survivors that you are supporting. Um, 
I'm also realizing we did not do a trigger warning at the beginning of this session, which we should have done. And I'm very sorry to anybody who wasn't prepared for the, the topics we we're gonna talk about. Um, it's very important information and Janice is clearly speaking the truth as is everyone else going to, but just wanna note if anyone is struggling with any of the stuff we're talking about tonight, please do chat myself, chat any of the, um, the organizers Chris or Wendy, um, and we would love to help you or speak with you um, if you're struggling. Also, feel free to take a moment away from the computer if some of the content is too much for you. So um, thanks again. And we're gonna move on to Michelle to share. Michelle, how does the community you support, um, how are they impacted by gender-based violence? Yeah, um, thank you. First of all, I think it's really important to um, acknowledge the traditional role of Indigenous women, that um, women were the matriarchs, were the backbone, were the fire keeper um, of their families, of their communities, of their nations. And, you know, so when colonization happened, there was, there was this shift, this imbalance of, of who we were and our traditional roles. And we began to be seen as less than um, kind of the most disrespected, you know, um, woman in Canada would be the Indigenous woman. Um, so I also, with that said, I want to acknowledge that I have the privilege of being able to walk and know and see and meet strong Indigenous women who have reclaimed their role, that they have um, reconnected with who they were they are as Indigenous women um, who, you know, are furthering their education, their mothers who are raising a good family, they're healing, they're walking a good path. The, the Cree word would be Mio Pimatsuin. So I'm, I am surrounded by amazing, strong Indigenous women, despite our history in this nation. Now at Edmonton Native Healing Center, we do serve, we do walk with, we do journey um, with a vulnerable community. Um, homelessness. So there was just this um, report that was released this month for our city and homelessness is a big crisis in Edmonton. And it's, there was, it was about 55% of that homelessness community is women. And then 64% um, is Indigenous peoples. So, you know, we make up a large number of that homeless, that vulnerable community. So, you know, our community, while it's um, a beautiful community, it's a community that's profoundly hurting. Um, so struggling with addictions and mental health and poverty and homelessness. And it's a lot of our Indigenous women. So already right there is a vulnerability, which creates more vulnerability. So I had I sat in this presentation about safety, women and safety, and the RCMP officer was kind of just giving some tips how how you keep yourself safe, you know, watch where you park at night. But if you're a, a woman who struggles with homelessness, who struggles with poverty issues, who's living in a low income neighborhood, you're already right there exposed to more crime and violence, right? And so statistics tell us that it's the indigenous women who faces, who bears that brunt of violence and crime more than any other um, woman in this nation. Um, so I have a couple of statistics that, that I got from Amnesty International. So. If you are an Indigenous woman in Canada, life expectancy is five years shorter. You're at least five times more likely to be murdered. You report three times the level of victim vic violent victimization. You are three times more likely to live in poverty and you are three times more likely to live in unsafe and inadequate housing. So our already vulnerable people are now being exposed to more trauma, more violence, more crime in their lives. I, I always kind of joke at, at the Edmonton Native Healing Center that you don't wanna be around when the sun goes down, when the lights go off, because it is a community. In, at night, there's prostitution, there's 
um, gang activity, there's crime, there's violence. So now you have a community of women who are living here. So what's going to happen? They're more exposed to this violence and crime. I would also like to um, address a lot of the women who come through our doors um, are women who've lost who they are, that they've lost their, their spirit, they're, they're disconnected. And I think that that's important to realize. Um, Self-esteem, self-worth is huge. Um, so if you have a woman who doesn't see herself as worthy, then she sometimes will put herself in, into relationships where abuse and violence is considered okay just because of how she views herself. So I think that for us at the Edmonton Native Healing Center, I think it's really, really important to connect our women back to culture, back to who they are, back to ceremony, back to teaching, um, back to self-worth, that we aren't statistics, that we have a gifts, we have our traditional roles, um, we have something to offer this world. So we provide support in whatever capacity. I always say we always do wear different hats. You never know. Uh, every day looks different. Uh, so we offer mental health, which has been huge um, in the last five years. It's been huge. And a lot of our women are ac ac accessing. Um, we have counselors, which has been amazing because at Edmonton Native Healing Center, this is their community. This is where they feel safe. So then they'll be able to access those pieces that they need, like a counselor, having those conversations. I think it's really important as well to build community. Um, you know, we as human beings are wired for connection. And when you're out there struggling and being vulnerable, um, sometimes that connection comes in unhealthy ways. So at Edmonton Native Healing Center, we hope to create a safe space so the women do feel that they can make these connections. And through those connections and relationships, some of that healing begins to happen. So we really are there as an organization and we're a ministry of presence. I feel like we have um, capacity to do a lot of different jobs. We can do a lot of good work. We're really all about walking with the people, um, offering healing where there can be, but also talking about these moments of, or these times of systemic racism that um, we as Indigenous peoples, and particularly women, face um, in our society. So I th thank you so much for the opportunity to lend my voice to this conversation. Hi, hi. Thanks, Michelle. Do you, do you want to share a little bit about the work you do with Isquail? I just yeah. think that's such an interesting program that you guys run. Thank you. Chris, you can go back to that slide. Yeah, so Esquail Health. Um, you know, for years working at the Edmonton Native Healing Center, sometimes it's always been just like hearing the hard stories and the, the sad stories. We know that's part of our history and we understand that, but we wanted to create space where we can really empower the women. So, so there in this picture, you see uh, some of our women and this is in the fitness studio. So I offer different fitness classes and it's just a way of engaging the community. It's a, a way of empowering our women. It's a way of building relationships and making those connections um, where our, our women feel safe and strong. So this has been happening for four plus years. Like right after this, I'm actually gonna do a fitness kickboxing class with the ladies. So it's just a way just to engage in a different way. So kind of thinking outside that box, how can we empower, strengthen and build relation and capacity within our indigenous women? And this is one of the ways that we're able to do that. Awesome, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think as, as I'm listening to each panelist, it's becoming very clear that the issue of gender-based violence is very intersectional. You know, it's very much connected to race and to privilege and to immigration status as um, Sarah is gonna share with us. So Sarah, do you wanna share a bit about um, the population that you serve? Uh -huh. So I'm not, I mean, I'm going to answer this question, but um, 
uh, you know, living up to the mission of our organization. I'm going to spend a few minutes um, zooming out a bit and providing some background knowledge on systems of violence. Um, for me, it's really important that we have this context. Um, and, and the reason I think it's important that we think about this issue, you know, from the zoomed out more academic perspective is because I think we have a tendency of looking at um, populations that have been deemed mar marginalized, or we have a, a tendency to look at populations like, like immigrants uh, seeking asylum in the United States, or we look at uh, countries south of the US border, um, and we, we typify them, we stereotype them, we think of them like in a mission type concept, like a group of people or a country that's um, less than and in need of help. And so the reason I think it's so important that we take a step back and examine the systems that create the violence and the vulnerability is so that we also see ourselves within the system. So we're not just we're not just seeing the other, we're not identifying an other that you know has all these problems, but we're also looking at our own countries and our own communities and we're seeing, we're identifying with this and realizing, wow, there's a lot that we need to fix right here that this isn't just somebody else's problem. So Chris, if you can jump to the first slide. Um, so levels of violence or vulnerability, we see this a lot, um, you know, we'll use the, this scale or like these, these identifiers uh, when we're talking about a variety of different um, mental health issues, uh, violence issues, um, because I work a lot with domestic violence, we'll use this a uh, similar model in that way. But either way, we look at it basically from like a big to small, macro to micro. Um, so first we've got systemic or societal, then we've got community and then interpersonal. And community and interpersonal can sometimes blur together. And then finally, we've got the individual. Next slide. So um, I just finished reading uh, Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and he is all about blaming the policies, blaming the systems, don't blame the people. And so I think when we're talking about gender-based violence, it's, it's really easy to blame the people. Um, at least in the work I do, I get really angry at the rapists, the abusers, the traffickers. Um, and a lot of times because the work that I'm doing is focusing on very micro level aggressions and violence, it's hard for me to see the big picture, the, the system, the society or societal influences that created that microaggression. Um, so when I say policies, I mean, um, or I really mean systems, um, systems that result in, in policies. And so these policies in general, um, as, as several have already pointed out, are policies that have resulted from colonization. So like we have a country here in the United States that was built on colonization, was built on the oppression of indigenous peoples. It was built on the oppression of black populations, of, of slaves, of um, eventually of um, Latinx immigrants brought in for labor, Chinese immigrants. Like it's just like the history of the United States is oppression. Um, and these policies were largely made by white men and continue to be made by white men. And so um, I know I sound like a broken record and maybe a little harpy, but policies made by men, policies executed by men, policies upheld by men. It is so important if we want to see transformation within, um, within these policies that we need to, we need to target policies and legislation. Um, these, are, these are the results of the systems. Um, and so one, one thing that I want people to understand is like, as long as we've got men, especially white men, um, continuing to dominate these fields, continuing to dominate political fields, both on the local and the federal level, we're, going to, we're never gonna actually see true systemic and societal transformations. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, my hero, I cried so hard when she passed away. She said, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. I see everyone walking around with t-shirts and drinking out of mugs with this saying on it. I would love to modify the saying 
or her quote to say, women must be in all places where decisions are being made. If we truly wanna be seeing change on a systemic level, women have got to be there. And so in, in terms of what we can do, we need to elevate female leadership um, and make sure that they have access to these positions that we're putting them in these places. That's so important. And so that starts with raising our daughters to think that they can be leaders, to see themselves in these offices, um, to see themselves making these changes in their community. It starts with educating our students, um, if you're an educator, and it starts with educating our community as well. I feel so privileged to have um, opportunity to educate the West Michigan community on these issues and particular, particularly speak to women and um, breathe strength into them as they, as they go along in their journey in life and seek to make changes in their own communities. Um, next slide. So community is, is next down on that, that um, on those levels that I was talking about. So what we're really talking about here is fighting that culture of violence. Um, and you can do that through, I've, I've listed a few things like faith and service organizations, educational systems, mental health services, community cohesion, counter narratives. Um, counter narrative campaign is like the Me Too movement, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, these things are what create a safe and supportive community. Without these things, you're gonna see a lot more gender-based violence and a lot of other, other things that result when you really don't have a strong community that is pushing back against that culture of violence. And someone mentioned earlier that oftentimes, or what, what was a really harsh reality was realizing that um, some of these service providers can actually be the victimizers. And so um, faith services is just an example of a group that can reinforce systems of violence through um, things that they're teaching their, their women or, or reinforcing in the, the messaging. Um, I'm just thinking about my own experience growing up in an e-free church, um, constantly being told that I was, I was secondary to you know, my future husband, that I had to be subservient and that um, you know, it was constant, constantly this message of less than. And so that kind of sets the stage for a woman's um, and a young girl's perspective of self within, within their own community. So being careful about the messaging that's coming from our own organizations is so important. Uh, poor educational systems, in particular educational systems that again, reinforce systems of violence. Um, we're seeing this in our own community here where like one example that is really, um, chapping my bottom right now is the, the, the dress code. Like we seem to have this, um, this um, what am I trying to say? Like it, it, our dress code basically reinforces a lot of these gender norms and, and victim blaming. I, one of our neighbor girls who's 10 is at a West Ottawa school and she was told by her teacher um, because she was wearing a spaghetti strap dress for picture day she was told she needed to cover her shoulders because boys can't control themselves. And so that sort of language, that sort of reinforcement of the victim blaming culture happening in our educational systems is so damaging. And so we need to be prepared to combat that um, on a community level. Um, barriers to health care, uh, barriers to mental health care, um, these are things on the community level that don't create a safe and supportive community. Um, and then again, harmful narratives. So they're like counter, counter narratives to the Me Too movement. Um, and so those are things that really send harmful me messaging. Just in general, when we're talking about the immigrant community, Donald Trump is a prime example of someone who is really promoting a harmful narrative about immigrants in our community. So those are things that we need to be prepared to push against, prepared to um, transform and uproot and do whatever we need to do so that we're creating a safe and supportive community where gender-based violence cannot thrive. Next slide. Um, so interpersonal, these are relationships and I like to think of it in, in three uh, groups. So you've got social capital um, and I feel like this is a really terrible, not a terrible buzzword, but it's just very buzzy, um, jargony. So what I'm really trying to say with this is that 
um, these are like the supportive relationships built on trust, shared values, shared norms, shared um, sense of identity. And um, it's, you know, that cooperation and, and reciprocity that happens um, in, in good, healthy relationships. And so a lot of times when you stop and consider about disenfranchised individuals in our community, what they're lacking is social capital. Um, we have a really uh, fascinating and very successful program called Circles USA, where they're really focused in particular on building social capital to combat poverty. And um, they're doing this through mentorship relationships. But those, those mentors, friends, um, social and caseworkers, teachers, spiritual leaders, family, those relationships are so important, um, especially when, when um, working to prevent things like gender-based violence and victimization. Um, people, again, who are isolated are more vulnerable. And so the more social capital they have, the less vulnerable they are. Um, coalitions and networks. Um, so I've really um, become fascinated with um, broad-based organizing. And this is really what, where I'm getting at with this particular um, point is that fostering these, these coalitions and networks, it strengthens the, the, the organizing power of people with, who have shared values, uh, again, norms, identities, um, and this gives them more power in the political and societal spheres. And we're seeing this work in, in Holland. Um, Holland is a very conservative or was a very conservative um, area where it was very dominated by de white Dutch Christian culture. And so to see these coalition, coalitions and networks um, coming together and creating change in our community is amazing. Um, and it just shows the power of, of the people, which is the next, um, the next little, what do you, I'm gonna have a box here. Um, so it really, it's, it's together, when we join together, when we join forces, we're able to really change those systems and policies of violence. We're able to provide support to each other um, and particularly support to people who have experienced violence and we're able to provide uh, support and intervention in places where there is high risk of gender-based violence. Um, and I, this one is just so crucial um, when, you know, both looking at community change and then systemic change. Um, and then next slide. So a lot of times I feel like when we're talking about gender-based violence, again, I have a tendency to do this too because I'm always working with the individual. Um, and so the reason I leave this to for the last uh, is because, you know, the, there really is as a community, as a, as, a, as a society to focus so much on the individual. Um, and what, what's really happening, even if you have a healthy individual within a broken system, that person is still going to struggle. Um, and so I give examples of things that could be said to a, a, you know, a woman, even if, you know, Aaron and I were talking about it this evening and he pointed out, you know, Hillary Clinton and Gretchen Whitmer here in Michigan, like they are paragons of success and yet here they are being vic victimized and, you know, we're finding fault with them. And that's what we do as a society with women. So, um, you know, it's really important that the individual be healthy but understanding that even a healthy individual within a broken system is not necessarily going to have, have it easy. Like we really have to fix the system. Next one. All right, and then finally, I really wanted to like take this back to um, the immigration issue. So um, understanding gender-based violence as a push factor. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of this. If we're recording it, uh, you guys can take time to read through this, but um, sending countries, that's what we think of it in terms of immigration. Um, we think of people coming to the United States because of push factors, like they're being pushed out of their country. Um, and so countries like Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, we see a lot of gender-based violence. Um, we see it, um, you know, in the form of sexual violence with gangs and cartels who are using it as a manipulative technique, as a punishment. Um, and then we also see it in the form of domestic violence. Guatemala, for example, does not prosecute domestic violence like we do in the United States. Even here in the United States, I don't think we prosecute it enough. 
Um, but just it's important to note that only about 10% of gender-based uh, violence crimes are prosecuted um, and lead to a conviction. And so as a result, you know, when a government is unable to protect their people and, um, and or not willing, then that forces people out of their country. So they come fleeing to a place where they think they're gonna be safe. So that jumps us into the next category. So gender-based violence while migrating. So a lot of times um, we'll see uh, violence happen at the hands of the coyote or the trafficker who's bringing someone to the United States, if that's the method that they've chosen for travel to the United States. La Bestia is the name of the train that people a lot of times will ride up to that um, southwest border. Victimization happens there. Um, and a lot of times you'll see it like, you know, a vulnerable woman is, is seeking protection. And so as a result, she'll make herself um, I don't know, basically enslaved to a male counterpart uh, for the purposes of protection. Um, and I've worked with several women who are coming out of those situations. Um, so you see it happening in, in the journey to the United States. And then once they're in the United States, all of these issues are compounded. They think they're escaping it, but they get here and they discover, oh my gosh, we've got gender-based violence, you know, pretty much in the same form as I was experiencing in my country. And then, um, you know, a lot of times they're still stuck with their trafficker or with the, the gang member who was pre protecting them in the journey to the United States. And then in addition to that, what we're finding also is that immigration status becomes yet another form of um, coercion and um, manipulation. And, um, and a lot of times language limitations and financial insecurities further make them more vulnerable, exacerbate their, their vulnerabilities. Um, so again, you're seeing how like all of these different levels, the systemic and the community, the interpersonal and the individual all plays into gender-based violence for, for the immigrant. Right, I'm done, sorry. <laughs> That's so great. Um, thank you, Sarah, for sharing with us the, the broader picture and helping us see the systemic issues um, behind why a lot of people experience gender-based violence, but also, I guess, like you said, how it compounds um, for people who are seeking safety um, in the US and thinking that the system is gonna be different than where they're coming from. So thank you. Thank you so much for illuminating that for us. Um, our final panelist is Eric. Eric, do you want to share more about your work with Safe Church? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Safe Church Ministry, I mentioned at the beginning that Safe Church started back in 1989 when the church, our synod of the Christian Reformed Church, realized that abuse happens just as much in the church. And, uh, and it, I think what Sarah was talking about, looking at the narratives, looking at the system, it pinpointed not just pointing fingers at the world, but it, we started to look at ourselves and we said, wait a second, we need to do far more than what we were doing before, which was minimal. And so um, Safe Church began in 1994 and it started as the Office of Abuse Prevention. And uh, a major part of what we did was um, clergy misconduct. And, uh, and now we have continued to see all of the narratives of abuse and how so many of these are stitched together to create systems that in many ways are not responding well to abuse and that awareness isn't being raised and, and that, that we're doing uh, that, that we're doing some prevention but we're not doing it in a way that's able to fully live up to what we are called to do as the church and so um, I would say what is the narrative of of abuse and gender-based violence in the church. And in many ways, I think we think of safe church or abuse and we think of uh, children's policies, which is major, it is huge. It is something that we should focus on and ensure that uh, nobody who is especially vulnerable uh, can be preyed upon. And so, uh, but at the same time, uh, what are the other narratives that are uh, either enabling abuse to take place in the church or cause us to just turn a blind eye or perhaps cause us to be blind in and of itself when abuse is so apparent. And so when it comes to abuse and gender-based violence, 
uh, there are so many factors at play here. And uh, being the only male pa panelist, I will say that this is a men's issue. Like looking in our history, uh, we can as men say and realize that this has been an ongoing pattern and cycle and uh, we can't just sit by and be okay with it, but we can stand up, we can partner and we can, like you said, Sarah, elevate women to spaces where they have just as much say and we are able to partner in ways that are um, honorable and where each person is seen as an image bearer of God, that we are not separate in our, in our value. Uh, you know, Diane Langberg has done incredible work around abuse of power issues. And she just released a book in, um, here uh, last month. And she's told a story about how when she grew up in the church, she felt like every Sunday she had to come in to the service and she had to take her brain and put it to the side, go through church and then leave and then pick her brain back up. What are the narratives in our church that m allow that to happen? And how can we as, as, mem as followers of Christ say that this is not okay, that we are able to um, live into the beauty of the kingdom of God and see uh, the, the beauty of each person, men and women, and being able to be in partnership well. And so Safe Church Ministry is uh, what we do is equip congregations to build communities free from abuse, where the value of each person is honored and faith can flourish. Uh, and so when we're thinking of gender-based violence, uh, in many ways, there are so many things that intersect with the church as we, um, this is not just, you know, something that you go to on a Sunday morning, but uh, I believe we are the church and that every split space that you occupy is a place where value uh, and it is that you are um, the place where you are. And so much of abuse uh, doesn't happen Sunday mornings. It happens at in the home and it happens um, to the church. And so if you are a pastor of a church, what happens when a woman comes to you and says, my husband is doing this and this and this. Uh, and in many ways, that man could be a member on council. They could be somebody who has a lot of reputation in the community. And in so many ways, those who are in power of the church often want to protect the reputation of the church or protect the reputation of that person. And they will not give the type of care and justice to that situation. And so, uh, and so th that's a major part of what we do is uh, as a pastor, how do you treat that situation? And if you're not treating it with justice, uh, in my opinion, it is an abuse of, it is an abuse of power. It's a spiritual type of abuse. And so we do a lot of raising awareness of, of abuse. And recently um, I had the opportunity to create an abuse of power training, which will be uh, a requirement for all pastors in the Christian Reformed Church going forward. And we're hoping it can uh, be utilized by all pastors currently as well. Uh, so how are we as faith leaders, um, staff in churches, or, or any person using, using our power well? And um, a part of this training is uh, being trained in power and control wheels. And the Duluth model has done uh, really good work in being able to name what behaviors uh, are controlling and uh, to empower people to to not allow these things to to continue to go on and on and to seek help. And so if you're a pastor and uh, a woman comes to you with their story, which often the stats show that one of the first people that uh, someone will go to is their faith leader, is their pastor, that may not that stat may not be holding up because of the reputation of the church, but it often is, uh, especially in, in places where there are, uh, it is so much of the church is a part of their identity. And so, um, in, in my opinion, uh, you know, as, as a white male, I think many times we want to take, use our power and say, no, this can't happen and intervene. But stats have also shown that domestic violence situations are among the most dangerous. And so when we try to use our power, we may be even bringing more danger to another person. And so how do we, how do we empower 
uh, other people? How do we allow them to make a decision and uh, not hold up an idea that they will they are somehow trying to uphold their marriage and that that is the godlier thing to do? But in fact, the marriage vows were already broken. Um, and so understanding the spectrum there and having theology that is uh, dignifying and upholding the gospel of Jesus. And so th there's a long history of uh, understanding scripture verses and the, to back up uh, power that is not used well. It's um, unfortunately a, a major part of, of the church's history. And so how do we change that narrative and how do we continue to uh, do what we can do to um, uphold the dignity of all people. And, uh, and I think um, creating spaces where people can share their story uh, and that a person could feel safe coming forward. And uh, what, what would it look like if we preached on abuse at least once a year uh, to, to name the real things that people are going, to, going through? And so that's a little bit of uh, the ways that Safe Church Ministry continues to work towards ending gender-based violence. Thank you, Eric. Um, that, that was really helpful and really a good way for our participants to understand the ways that their local church um, is impacted but can also make a difference. Um, so that brings us to our second question here for the webinar. What, in your opinion, um, as an expert, <laughs> On, on the issue um, that you've talked about so far tonight. What's the most important thing that our churches or members of our churches or our communities can do to support you, to support your agency and the work you do and, and to ally with your community? What's, what's the number one or two things that, that people can do um, to support the work? Uh, Janice, go ahead. Thank you so much. So one thing that I want to encourage you all is that it was, it's a very traumatic issue, human trafficking of girls and women, um, and, but it isn't too big of an issue for individual individuals to make a difference. The issue though, is that uh, you very difficult for people who, to kind of go out into the community and find people who are trafficked, girls and women. And I wanna bring this issue again back to the psychological trauma. Where we can look for your support is that you will help out agencies in the community who are doing the kind of work we're doing because we use very much in our work individuals who've gotten themselves out of trafficking or we've helped get out of trafficking because the level of trust from sort of a peer level is critical. So um, even if somebody identifies that they're in trafficking, they have a very impossible time trusting others, but they will trust somebody who has had a similar experience who can walk along alongside them. So where I'm asking um, for help is actually in prayer. Um, because what is important is that we, agencies like ours who have staff who have experiencing trafficking, they can go out in the community and they can find girls, but the average person cannot. And so that we are able to be supported in the work that we're done. And um, I'll invite you to reach out to Restorations Canada. We'll be organizing a prayer day, both uh, in Canada and in the United States for National Human Trafficking Awareness Day on Monday, January 11th. This might seem a simple thing, but it's a powerful thing. Human trafficking is extremely dark and we need God's light to be able to help women who've experienced trafficking, who work in trafficking agencies to be able to find other women. That's really how right now the model is working and we covet your prayers. Thank you so much for the privilege of being here tonight. Um, and again, uh, you can reach out to me directly also, but thank you so much. And thank you to the other panelists uh, for the privilege of being here. Thank you very much, Janice. Uh, Michelle, what is, what's the most important thing people can do to support um, Indigenous women and girls? Uh, yeah, I feel like, man, Janice said it all. Um, the biggest journey the elders would would share that we go on as human beings is the journey from the head to the heart. And I think it starts with knowledge. It starts with education. So even to read the final report, um, but even understanding in that final report, there were communities that weren't that's that, that ha weren't even consulted and and those numbers weren't even put in the report. So just 
doing some research on your own, having some conversations, checking out some books. There's tons of material out there. So making that commitment to educate yourself. And from there, you know, trans, it hopefully transforms the heart and sit with it and pray with it, pray on it. Um, Cause we really covet your prayers as well. I think prayer is powerful, but I also believe that there needs to be action out of those prayers. So we would say from the head to the heart, to reaction, to being, to doing something to, so um, I invite you to be creative in, in how you want to get involved. And I've been listening to Eric talk about um, the church, like invite an indigenous woman to come speak and, and see the gift that she has to bring. I remember that we're, we were matriarchs of our community. We were backbone. So even, so looking at those pieces, like how can I, we can make those connections. Um, so when you do that, even you're across the country from Edmonton and you're engaging in your community and the indigenous women that are around you, that is powerful. That helps us. Like we're, we're here on this journey together. Um, and so just engaging with your own community, I think is really, really important. Hi, hi. Thank you, Michelle. Sarah? Um, so for me, I am all about the action. Um, so there, again, I'm gonna go back to that model that I talked through. So there are systems that need to be changed. And so, a powerful tool for changing those systems is, again, the broad-based organizing, the people power. So coming together, churches here in Holland have banded together to form two different coalitions. We've got the Faith Leaders for Justice, and now we have the Lakeshore Coalition for Racial Justice. And we have seen those groups work in powerful ways, um, and they are using their we see faith leaders using their positions at the pulpit to influence change, to speak um, out on behalf of social justice and, and oppressed members of our community at the pulpit. Like this is so like mind blowing here in Holland. You don't like, you don't preach politics from the pulpit, but we have so many pastors who, and um, priests and reverends and whatever their titles are doing this in our community and it is so powerful and we are seeing movement and we are seeing change and we are seeing action. Um, so uh, I think it is so important that as as church members and church leaders that you look for ways to create these coalitions, to create these networks and look for ways that you can change the systems, For look, look for ways that you can change things within your community, create these services within your community that are going to combat things like gender-based violence, racism, sexism, xenophobia, whatever, these systems of violence. Um, and, you know, on a more individual level, if you want to use prayer or meditation to self-examine, that's great. Um, but if we really want to see transformation within our community, we need the action, um, in, in my perspective. Um, and it's really working here in Holland. Um, and then um, another example, this is more of the interpersonal, um, that, that uh, second tier that we talked about. Um, I have a couple of churches who have come alongside of our secular organization and they're wanting to provide resources um, to our organization. So basically funding to our organization so that we can develop uh, what we're calling a community navigator program. Um, and so the purpose of it is to help, is to create that social capital that I talked about. So we know that new immigrants to our community and even immigrants who have been here for a while are lacking that social capital, um, that, that human resource. And so what we're looking to do with this program is to um, get people connected with mentors who are gonna walk alongside of them and help them to access those community resources, those faith-based resources, those um, social service resources, uh, mental and healthcare resources. Um, um, because we know that, and, and again, this is my, this is my social worker hat. I'm, I'm both an attorney and a social worker. I can't uncouple the two, but, um, but we know that for that 
person to become whole and included and fully welcomed to the community, they need that piece of it. They need that social capital um, and access to that broad range of services, not just in legal service to help uh, regularize or legalize their immigration status, but that whole package of services. And so churches who are replete with resources, look for opportunities to partner with nonprofit organizations um, who are really just looking for opportunities to partner with, with organizations to build these new services. Like you've got people who are already planted in your community that are experts in this area that um, are equipped to, to design and offer these types of services, but they're just waiting for the financial resources to come along. So seek out those opportunities. Um, and I would really advise not to create those services within your own church without going to a nonprofit first who's already established um, in the area, already has built that rapport with the community. So seek out those opportunities because really it's such a, it's such a fantastic opportunity for churches to, to come alongside of an organization and provide that support. Um, and, and through that, you're going to, um, you know, change those interpersonal relationships and strengthen them and also create change at a community and system level. So it's, it's such an amazing um, opportunity for churches and individuals uh, to reach out in that way. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, if you have a moment and if you have any links to those coalitions that are local to Holland and Grand Rapids area, if you could throw some links in the chat box and even a link to the, the social advocates um, program you were talking about, or you can email them to us afterwards and we'll ma mail them out to everybody next week, whichever is easier for you. But we want to get that content out to people. Um, Eric, do you want to share about how people can support Safe Church or participate in Safe Church within the CRC? Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Uh, so Safe Church, we are a ministry that is an equipping ministry, which means we rely on people in the church to do the work that uh, that is a part of being the church. And so uh, as a safe church team, we have um, congregational safe church teams and also classes safe church teams. And the idea around, I think, people power, you know, that same kind of principle exists within our institutions as well, that we need to start, start movements within our institutions. And if there's not a lot going, if there's just one staff person at your church doing a little bit of policy work, how can we start moving together? Uh, how can you create a team uh, that not that doesn't just jump into policies, but jumps into the narratives of your congregation? Uh, what if you did a book study together? Uh, the Me Too Reckoning by Ruth Everhart is a fantastic book. Uh, we actually did a a book study together virtually with a variety of people. And um, Diane Langberg, Redeeming Power is a phenomenal book as well. Uh, and there's so many, there's so many resources out there partnering with agencies and uh, groups that, that are represented here today. Uh, what would it look like if you reached out and said, how can we help you and, uh, and heard about the things that are going on in your community? Um, and so, we hope that safe church teams are catalyzed and that we're able to encourage and equip each other to do this work. And, and everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a voice to share. And um, if you're in the, in the space where you're willing and able to share your story, um, how can you do that in your congregation? Uh, if it's a safe place and by not any, if, if it's not a safe place, how can we take uh, small steps to create a, uh, culture change that allows uh, abuse to be not tolerated and that we're able to understand the dynamics of gen gender-based violence and create a movement that's not just a movement, in my opinion, to end these things that are horrible, but it's a movement also to see the good shalom, that how things are supposed to be throughout the world um, and see Jesus' kingdom come. And so we, we think that uh, Safe Church and this work is is about the gospel and it's a heart, it's the heart of what it means for us to be the church. And so um, that, that's a little bit of the, what I, I might encourage internally for the church and then, uh, and then to reach out and allow your, your community to, um, to, to grow with, uh, from people from all backgrounds and experiences and stories. 
Thanks, Eric. That's so helpful. Um, as I put in the chat box, we're going to send out all of the resources that people have mentioned um, next week in an email. So if you didn't get the books that Eric said or the links that Sarah or anyone else said, we'll make sure that you get them. Um, now we're going to move on to talk a little bit about some of the other ways that you can take action. It, it wouldn't be a, a webinar with staff from the Office of Social Justice if there weren't action alerts. Mm -hmm. um, so I work for the Office of Social Justice as well as the Center for Public Dialogue in Canada. And one of the ways that we offer uh, people to be able to do advocacy is through our action centers. So Chris, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, the way that our action alerts work and how they enable people to speak out? Yeah, thank you. So this um, campaign, the overarching campaign that this webinar is a part of is called 16 Days of Activism to End Gender-Based Violence. And I think we've learned and heard pretty clearly through all of the panelists that uh, gender-based violence is a, something that happens on an individual person-to-person -person level, but is obviously part of a um, challenges within a bigger system too. And for Office of Social Justice in the US and World Renew in the US and Center for Public Dialogue in Canada and World Renew in Canada, we really see that uh, systemic working towards change on the systemic level is so, so important. And our elected officials um, will tell us again and again that change comes last for the US, change comes last to Washington, for Canada, change comes last to Ottawa, uh, it only happens when the will amongst the people in their communities are really pushing and agitating for that kind of change. So we have tools you can use. Um, in the US, it's the Office of Social Justice who we recommend signing up for. Cindy will have the link. And through those tools, uh, we will send you when legislation is coming closer to being passed or being introduced legislation like the DREAM Act, uh, legislation like um, making uh, legal immigration status easier to attain for farm workers or, or asylum seekers. Uh, when that kind of legislation is at its uh, moment when it's ready to be voted on and in the political spotlight, we'll give you tools that you can use to get in direct contact with your members of Congress. Um, because we just had an election, it's not that moment right now where we're encouraging direct contact, even though direct contact is really good at any time, but it's not um, the most important moment right now. So what we're asking really right now is to get signed up and then I'll skip ahead two here or three. If you do get signed up, there is one action for the US that we have going on right now, which is urging elected officials to support refugees. Um, so if you sign up, you would find yourself at the OSJ webpage here. You would put in your name, uh, your address, your zip codes so that they can figure out what uh, congressional district you're in. And uh, when you click, if you scroll down be below where you see send email there, you will see a pre-written letter to your member of Congress and you would be able to edit and kind of word that letter however you want to write it for your letter to Congress. The other thing that's happening when you do this is your name is getting on our mailing list and we actually have regional organizers across the US um, who are also doing the work to create more personal, personal relationships between constituents and those members of Congress. So depending on what district you're in, you may be invited to uh, become a part of legislative meetings to meet in person with your elected officials and also get resources to bring more learning opportunities to your church. Um, to help members of your congregation go deeper into some of the systemic issues, the higher level issues that are making uh, gender-based violence um, happen more often um, and kind of doing the opposite of prevention, really. And then uh, Matt Sorens is a person who works in the faith community on the topic of immigration a lot. And I would just commend his words to you uh, which are that a best friend of someone who is trying to do human trafficking or the best friend of someone who is a perpetrator of gender-based violence is a broken immigration system. Um, when our immigration system is the way that it is now and it's so difficult to gain legal status that opens up real pathways for people to get away with gender-based violence. So we're very committed to working to change those systems um, to help people gain legal status. Um, 
and additional protections. And I'll click back a couple and turn it over to Cindy to talk about Center for Public Dialogue. Yeah, um, in Canada, the Center for Public Dialogue works closely with the Office of Social Justice and we do the similar things. Um, and we have the same system for action alerts. Um, it's just called the Action Center RE in the Canadian spelling, of course. Um, but similar action alerts, um, similar system. And um, I will, in the next, in next week when I send you an email, I'll get you all the information you need uh, to sign up for these. But one action alert we have that's happening right now that's really important in Canada is the government is currently tabling legislation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UN DRIP. Um, is the short form for it, but essentially um, this United Nations Declaration is um, intended to uphold the rights of Indigenous people, to uphold their self-determination, their ability to make their own decisions for their own communities. And again, in a matriarchal community, right, as Michelle's saying, then women are, are decision makers and women are um, part of the, the community who are wanting to ensure that their, their sisters and their children are protected. And so Upholding the United Nations Declaration um, is a way to protect and care for women and girls. And even in the um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls report, one of their recommendations was to implement the United Nations Declaration. And so um, this is something that we have been working on in Canada for quite a few years um, within the Center for Public Dialogue. And there's real hope that this can be become legislation um, in the next year, the government has promised to table the legislation by the end of this year and to be working on it. So this is something we're really excited about and need energy around. So if this is something that matters to you, um, I did put the link there um, for the Canada Action Alert, but we'll send it next week in the email as well. But this is a great way to connect with your elected official, to contact your MP and let them know that this is something that you care about. And we will continue to be organizing around this definitely for the rest of the year. So if you're interested in knowing more about the work we're doing, um, we'll make sure there's a way for you to sign up for the Center for Public Dialogue newsletter as well, because we will share so much information on this over the next year as we ally with our Indigenous brothers and sisters to, to see this become law. So um, we're really excited about that. <laughs> Um, another great thing that you as participants can do is watch the next webinar, participate in the global focused gender based violence webinar that's happening on December 3rd. If you don't already know about that and aren't already signed up for it, um, you can look on um, World Renew's website, World Renew's Facebook um, to find information on that. And of course, we'll send the registration link for that in the email that's going out next week. But this is going to be a great webinar where you can learn directly from um, World Renew staff who work around the world, work specifically in the field, and about the ways that the, the communities that they are in um, are being affected by gender-based violence. So you don't want to miss this, and we would love to have you partake in that. Um, I haven't seen any questions come through. So if you've been sitting on a question and you're burning to ask something to any of us or any of our panelists, please put it in the chat. Um, we'd love to have you have a chance to have those questions answered by these wonderful panelists we have here today. Oh, there was one question for Eric. Chris, do you did you see that? Wendy, can you pop on and ask the question for Eric? I'm only seeing the chats from the panelists. Okay, I see it now. Um, says so this one's mostly for Eric. Um, so we have the, the words say we have failed many women because we have many churches where men have all the power and women are still allowed, are still not allowed in office and treated as less than. Um, what, what can the CRC do in this situation to continue to empower women, Eric, um, and make sure it's well known that every voice is equal? Yeah. Yeah, it's the history of the Christian Reformed Church at one of our synods that um, we upheld the ability for a council to um, allow their office bearers to be uh, restricted from women. And, uh, and so it's, I think it's an ongoing tension within the Christian Reformed Church. And 
and specifically the, the felt it, the stories um, by many women, whether in they are in a in a church setting as a pastor or a denominational position as a pastor, uh, where if they feel uh, their voice is not heard or mattered, and you know, it, uh, or or matters to that um, to that group of people, and you know, th there will be times when um, uh, people who hold to that position will actually walk out of the room and um and th th there is a a deep level i think of of disrespect and i think we have a long ways to go to understand the harm that has been caused and uh i'm, I'm a i'm a large i'm a huge proponent of restorative practices or restorative justice practices and uh i, I don't think that this is something that we're just going to jump over and and it's going to be good and everyone's going to be okay. I think that there needs to be acknowledgement of, of what has occurred in the past and there needs to be understanding um, both of people who continue to uh, be harmed in different ways and uh, in ongoing conversations, people to, person to person. And I think many times we, we take an issue and we, we don't understand the people that are behind the issue. Uh, and those who do hold to a more complementarian position, uh, how can we um, understand that this isn't simply an issue, uh, but you know, for them it may be a, very, a, a high holding of, of the scriptures, um, but then for them to understand how that impacts other people and to be in contact as the body of Christ, I, I think is important um, rather than uh, continue to just isolate one another and uh, allow disembodied arguments to, to continue, uh, especially in our social media space and, uh, and to specifically be, um, look in our arguments like the rest of the world, how can we honorably enter into differences of opinions and uphold respect and dignity for all people? And so, yeah, th that's a challenge. And um, I think it will continue to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Eric. And again, feel free to, we have time for a couple more questions here. So feel free to pop your questions in the chat. I have, um, oh, I see another one. I had one, but I'll put the, the audiences first before mine. So this one says, hearing that so many trafficking victims are local to our communities is tough. How can we use our social capital to prevent it before it begins? How can we be a resource for those most at risk. Um, and I'll just add on to that too. I, I would love to hear how can we, and also where have you seen or where are you seeing right now social capital being used and people power, organizing power being used to actually move the needle on um, one of the systemic level ch challenges in your community? Janice, you can start to answer that one. If anyone else wants to answer, they can jump in too. Yeah, so I really, um, I mean, it's really important this issue about partnership and right now education is critical for prevention. So right now the girls that are most at risk are teenagers who are on social media. So what needs to happen is churches need to come alongside agencies in the community like Sarah so nicely outlined because we need to be educating girls within the school systems. We need to be educating and working with police forces and we need to be working with other agencies that are supporting vulnerable populations. We also have to be educating teenagers about the risks around social media. So it's really significantly right now prevention. You have to be able to come alongside agencies and set aside faith issues. If you've got strong, like we are a faith uh, agency, but you need to come along agencies in your community that are doing good work about education and awareness so prevention can happen. Because right now with sex trafficking in Canada and the United States, the critical component that we're missing is that young girls and their families and their parents are not aware of some of those myths that I tried to rate out, uh, raise to you all, and those kinds of issues, and girls are, are vulnerable. So education, come alongside agencies, put aside faith and political lines, and make sure that education and prevention can happen, because too many people are blind to the issue. So that's what I'd like to say, and thank you so much for this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also jump in and just say, Janice can share more 
if you can think of the agencies, but I know that there are organizations that do this education in Canada specifically. I know there's Defend Dignity, there's um, 4-1, um, there, there's a National Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline. I know there's the Polaris Project in the US, their Human Trafficking Hotline, and there are organizations in almost every region in Canada and the US who have, they're, they're secular organizations, but they are doing work on preventing human trafficking. Um, and so reach out to your local, um, maybe your local assault center, reach out to your local women's organization because they will know who is doing this educational work and you can partner with them. I don't know if that second question, Chris, was meant for me, but mm -hmm. I can answer it. Yeah, um, sure, thank you. Um, so, and I also don't know if you were thinking specifically of like, so there's an issue in Holland right now. Um, there are a number of issues in Holland right now. And I can think of three uh, examples in particular where like we're seeing the needle move because of, um, you know, coalition work because of broad-based organizing. Um, so one thing that happened this week in particular, there was a video released by the Holland Visitors Bureau. And for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of Michigan, Holland is over on the west, the Midwest side. Uh, we're on Lake Michigan and our little town thrives on tourism and our Dutch heritage. Um, but what goes under or unrecognized far too often is the fact that for the last century, um, about a quarter of Holland's population is, is Latinx. Like we've had um, farm workers who came in with World War II to meet um, wartime labor shortages and they have stayed and, and um, you know, built their lives here. And now their culture is a very much a fundamental part of our city's identity, yet it's so often just swept to the side um, and dominated by the, the white Dutch culture. So anyway, um, tourism is, is uh, you know, kind of the linchpin to, to Holland's economy here. And so they just released this commercial um, featuring COVID safe Holland activities that you can do. Um, and the video featured white blonde people. And so, um, we're of course looking at this video wondering where's all the diversity in Holland because we know that a third of our city's population is demographically identified as people of color. Um, so we, we saw this video, we commented on Instagram and next thing we know we're calling this coalition that I'm a part of um, that recently formed out of the Faith Leaders for Justice um, is now calling meeting with the mayor, with the director of um, the Visitors Bureau and um, by the end of that day, they had pulled the video and said they were gonna remake it, but we're not stopping there. Um, we've written a letter now and we're looking at ways that we can start challenging the system itself that resulted in this video being made. Why was it that it got to the point of being released to Hallmark without anyone noticing that it only had white blonde people in it? Um, even our mayor who narrated it did not detect that. And supposedly, you know, he's all about, you know, DE and I work. And um, so it was, it's, it's a baby step. Like, I, you know, getting a, a video taken down is not like, you know, in, in terms of the work that needs to be done in Holland, it's not a huge step, but it's a baby step. And that's really how you have to work in Holland is in these baby steps. Um, Otherwise, we are also working, um, we have a police task force right now where we're looking into um, traffic stops in, in the city of Holland um, done by the Holland Police Department. We know that they're uh, racially profiling these stops. They're treating people of color um, more harshly during these stops. They're interrogating them more. They're using uh, fear tactics and threatening and coercion. Um, and so we have this anecdotal evidence. And so now through um, these different organizations that are coming together, um, we are combining resources and people power to um, get the, the data and results that we want. Um, and then also there's a piece of legislation here in Michigan called the Drive Safe Bill, uh, which would extend driver's licenses to all Michigan residents, regardless of immigration status. In 2008, Michigan legislature revoked that um, 
privilege from, from undocumented immigrants. And so for the last 12 years, they haven't been able to get a driver's license. And when you stop and consider how integral a driver's license is to your everyday life, you start to understand just how difficult the last 12 years must have been for undocumented immigrants. And so there's a group called Movimiento Cosecha here in Holland that is, um, they're disturbing the peace. That is their, their primary goal. And so other organizations are coming alongside and using their own strengths to support that um, goal. Their goal is to get a resolution letter from the Holland City Council. And so our organization, we are um, closely connected with council members. Um, we're very good at the backdoor negotiation and um, uh, manipulating media and um, getting things that we want in certain ways. And so we're using that power to come alongside and support what they're doing. Um, and other organizations are, are organizing um, their constituents in, in the ways that they can as well. So um, those are three examples of, of the way we've been using um, those interpersonal connections, the coalitions and networks to, to move the needle here in Holland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you panelists for answering questions. And I, I really appreciated everyone's presentations too, especially seeing the importance of thinking across a full spectrum if we wanna be activists uh, working to put an end to gender-based violence um, that we've gotta think about the full spectrum and participate in every way that we can at every level and especially uh, participating following the lead of experts like you. So I will jump over, oh, screen stuck here. Cindy, do you have last words? I'll turn it over to you to close us out. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we just, I just threw um, our websites up there. So if you want to find out more about Office of Social Justice or the Center for Public Dialogue, and then I, World Renews um, Peace and Justice website is going to be taken over for this 16 days of activism campaign um, starting on November the 25th. So next week. So keep an eye out for that. There's going to be a lot more ways you can participate in this campaign. Um, Thank you everyone for being here. M Michelle had to leave. She had to go do her kickboxing class. Um, but thank you to all the panelists who shared and to all the people who asked questions and to, who listened and participated in learning more about how you can make a difference. So I'm just gonna close us in prayer and then we'll head out for the night. Creator God, thank you um, that you have made each and every person um, to be beloved by you. You've made them each in your image. You have made them each valuable and each worthy of love and acceptance and belonging and protection. So I thank you for the panelists who shared honestly and candidly about the work that they do, that they feel called to do, that they know that they are um, upholding your righteousness and justice in the world. Um, I pray that you would um, protect the, the people that they serve, that you would um, give them encouragement as they continue in this work. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us um, who heard about this information tonight, that we would be convicted to do something, to speak out, to volunteer, to make a difference in some way. Um, thank you for, for your love and care for all of us and for all of creation. Amen. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful night and look out for the email from us early next week with all of the resources. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you.